and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and this is my Victoria TBR. This is my favourite readathon all about Victorian literature. This is a Victorian themed readathon that carries on throughout the month of October and it is hosted by four wonderful, lovely booktubers. They are Katie from Books and Things, Kate Howe, Lucy the Reader, and Ange from Beyond the Pages. Link in the description box if you, for some reason, are not already subscribed to them. So in this video I want to talk about the books that I'm planning to read for Victober, but I also want to talk about a playlist of music that I put together for Victober, and I'm going to do that first. So if you're not interested in the playlist of Victorian music, then go into the description box, you can find the timestamp there that takes you straight to the book talk, straight to the TBR. So. If you don't care about music, click the timestamp, that will take you straight to the TBR talk. But first, let me talk about this music playlist. Now this is something I did for the first time during Jane Austen July, where I put together a Spotify playlist of music from Jane Austen's time. Um, if you don't know, I'm a musicologist and my research specialism is on the first three decades of the 19th century. So the Jane Austen July playlist was right up my street. I am slightly less familiar with music in the second half of the 19th century and, well, from the mid-30s onwards, but I still tried to put together this playlist of music and this is a playlist that's meant to be listened to while you read your Victorian fiction. So it is a Spotify playlist, the link is in the description box, you can just go to that and then I think you can follow the playlist or subscribe to it or something or other. Let me talk to you about what this playlist is about then. This was inspired by one of the challenges for this year's Victober. And one of the challenges is to read a book by a female Victorian author and ideally a book by a female Victorian author that's new to you. So I looked into female Victorian composers and I would bet that the vast majority of these composers are new to you. They are not all British, so strictly speaking they're not all Victorians, but the music on the playlist was all composed during the Victorian period. So I decided to include a variety of nationalities of composers there just for a bit of variety really. My playlist, I can do what I like. So while a couple of names from this playlist might be familiar to you, maybe you've heard of Clara Schumann or of Louise Ferranc or of Fanny Mendelssohn, most of this is probably, I would bet quite a lot of money, is probably as new to you as it was to me when I was researching this playlist and putting it together. And I've made some really wonderful discoveries in music through this playlist. For example, one of my new favourite composers is a Swedish 19th century composer Elfrida André. I've really been enjoying her music through this playlist, both her works for organ and her chamber music. The majority of music by women throughout history, but music by women from the Victorian period in this case, has just not been recorded. And much of what has been recorded isn't on Spotify. So this is by no means representative of all the music that is out there. Uh, and of course, the more well-known composers like the aforementioned Louise Ferranc or Clara Schumann are more heavily represented than others, but you know, it's better than nothing. Originally, I wanted to make the playlist purely instrumental with no vocal music so that it can be easily listened to while reading. I don't know about you, but I find vocal music a little bit distracting when I'm reading, especially if the songs are in a language that I understand. I find it a little bit harder to focus on a book uh, when listening to vocal music. But I very quickly noticed that if I was going to limit myself to only instrumental music, it wouldn't be a very long playlist at all. And this is something that's specific to women composers, because throughout history, uh, women have been discouraged from composing in general. But if they had to be composers, they were very much encouraged to only compose what we would nowadays call small scale works. So solo music and small chamber ensembles. And the voice was a very particular uh, kind of more accepted instrument for women to compose for. So there is lots of music 
in there for voice and piano, for example, just because that was a little bit more acceptable for women to compose for than, say, a symphony or a concerto. However, there are a few symphonies and concertos on the playlist among the songs and and, and the preludes. Uh, overall, I'm hoping it is quite balanced because even though just in terms of numbers there are more vocal pieces on there than symphonies, obviously a symphony is much much longer than a song, so I'm hoping that overall it will balance out. The whole playlist is rather long, it's over 36 hours, so hopefully um, if you go to it, set it on shuffle so you get a bit of a variety there and you'll, you'll find you'll discover some new favourite music hopefully from some female composers who you wouldn't necessarily uh, have come across otherwise. So go check it out, link in the description box, tell me if you enjoy the music, tell me if you've made some new discoveries and tell me if there are any important women that I, I forgot to put on there that aren't on the playlist um, but they have to be available on Spotify otherwise I can't add them to it. I really enjoyed putting together the Jane Austen July playlist. That one was a little bit more specific, that one was a little bit more curated I would say um, simply because I don't know as much about Victorian music as I do about early 19th century music but uh, I enjoyed doing it and I came across so much new to me music and uh, we should all be listening to more music composed by female composers. Check it out, tell me if you like it and tell me if you don't like it. Let's get to the TBR then. Hello if you've come here from the timestamp. Um, my Victoria TBR for this year, for this year, like it wasn't the same last year, is fairly mainstream so if you're looking for hidden gems you might want to check out one of the more knowledgeable uh, booktubers about Victorian literature. I still am very much drawn to the big names because there are books that I haven't yet discovered. And there are always challenges in Victoba, one from each host and then there's a group challenge and then there's also a group read and I will take you through all of these and tell you what I'm planning to read for each of the challenges. The first challenge is Angela's challenge which I have alluded to earlier and that is to read a book by a female Victorian author and ideally one that new to you and my pick for that is George Eliot's Silas Marner. I picked this book up sometime in the last year in a charity shop intending to save it for Victoba and I'm glad that I have made it this far without reading it. I've never read a George Eliot book before. I feel like she divides opinion. Some people absolutely love her, some people don't get on with her at all and quite a lot of people love some of her works and hate others. Silas Marner I, I know nothing about what this is about. I don't even know what the title means. I'm assuming it's a place or a name of a person. I, I have no idea. Um, this is why I'm great at TBRs because I know nothing about the books I read and don't do any research. Honestly, I don't know why you're even watching this. This is my pick for Angela's Challenge. George Eliot, female author who is completely new to me and I cannot wait to dive into her work. The next challenge is Kate's challenge, which is to reread a Victorian book. This is either the best or the worst idea I have ever had. I am going to reread Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Um, I'm holding up this gorgeous edition of the Bronte Sister Three novels. Realistically, I'll probably just download it onto my Kindle and read it from there. I hated Wuthering Heights, the last time I read it, which was a couple of years ago, not that long ago, maybe three years ago, four. I hated it so much. I just did not get on with the book at all. I could not understand why anyone, anyone likes this book. So it's an obvious choice for a reread, isn't it? No, the idea behind this is that so many people love Wuthering Heights and there's got to be a reason for that. I don't think I'm right. I think they're right. I think it's a classic for a reason. I think people love it for a reason and I want to be in that club. I want to know and understand the reason why people love this book. So, you know, I'm going to pick it up again. I'm going to read it again for Victober. And yes, there will be a reading vlog. I will probably do um, one of those videos that I do occasionally where I record my reaction as I'm reading the book and then 
edit that together into a video of me basically just reacting to Wuthering Heights. I'm really hoping that I will love it this time because I want to know what the fuss is about. I want to know what people love so much about Wuthering Heights when I just really seriously disliked it the first time round. I might dislike it again, but I might not. I'm willing to change my mind. Let's get to the next challenge then, which is Katie's challenge, and that is to read a book that's under 250 pages and or over 500 pages long. I'm a lazy bitch, I'm gonna pick the shorter version. And uh, one book, and I'm gonna hold up this again. <laughs> again, I'm not gonna read it from here, I'm gonna download it onto my Kindle if I don't find a copy in the charity shop before October. Uh, I'm planning to read Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. I sound like a broken record when I say that Anne Bronte's The Tenant of Wildfell Hall was one of my absolute favourite reads of last year. Loved it so much. Obviously, I am going to pick up Anne Bronte's other novel because, sadly, she only ever wrote two. And um, Agnes Grey, in most editions that I've come across online, is under 250 pages. Seems like a rather short book. Hopefully that won't take me too long. If a miracle happens and I manage to get through that, I might then also try and read a book that's over 500 pages, although I don't think I have any of those with me right now. Realistically, that's not going to happen. I can't wait to read Agnes Grey. I know that it is the story of a governess, which obviously gives me Jane Eyre vibes, because that is also the story of a governess. And finally, and I have to say, this is possibly my favourite challenge, just because of the originality of it, Lucy's challenge is to read an underrated book from the same year as a favourite. Um, as a favourite Victorian novel, obviously. I feel like I don't have to mention that because this is about Victober. So my favourite Victorian novel, and in fact my favourite novel, is The Picture of Dorian Gray, which was published in 1890. So we're right at the end of the Victorian period. So I did the obvious thing and looked at 1890 in literature on Wikipedia, and I came across a book titled Gloriana, or the Revolution of 1900, and this is by Lady Florence Caroline Dixie. So the title was very intriguing, obviously, because it's called The Revolution of 1900, but it was published in 1890. So immediately my mind went to 19th century dystopian fiction, futuristic fiction. I love that kind of stuff. I love classics that are set in the then future, if you know what I mean. I love that about... Uh, books like Brave New World and 1984 and there's there's a lot of books that are set in the future from when they were written. Ooh, Mary Shelley's The Last Man is another one like that. So that was immediately intriguing. Then I looked into what Gloriana or the Revolution of 1900 is actually about and it seems to be not a dystopian novel but a utopian novel and it is specifically a feminist utopian novel. So this uh, starts off in 1900, but apparently it then goes further into the future throughout the 20th century. And the main character is a woman named Gloriana who manages to get elected into the House of Commons. It's basically a what if society was equal type narrative. And I find that so fascinating. I looked a little bit into the biography of the author, Lady Florence Dixie, as well, and there's another strange connection between her life and that of Oscar Wilde, because she was the youngest daughter of the eighth Marquess of Queensbury, whose eldest son was the father of Lord Alfred Douglas, who was Oscar Wilde's lover. And um, the ninth Marquess of Queensbury was involved in the court battle with Oscar Wilde. So Lady Florence Dixie's nephew was Oscar Wilde's lover. I mean, Britain's small, right? Britain's tiny. What can I say? It's just a fun little connection between the biographies of the two 
authors. But her life otherwise sounds very interesting. She was an adventurer, she was a staunch suffragette and writer, and I'm amazed that I haven't heard of her. Please let me know if you have heard of Lady Florence Dixie, because she feels like exactly the sort of person who would appeal very much to a 21st century reader and I'm really hoping that I'll enjoy her novel Gloriana or The Revolution of 1900 because it sounds like, sounds like such a fun and original concept for a novel. So that was the TBR that I've picked. The group reads um, are going to be two Oscar Wilde plays and they are A Woman of No Importance and The Importance of Being Earnest. I have read both of them previously. I will at least read along with A Woman of No Importance because I haven't read that one in a few years. I haven't seen it in a few years either. Um, I might read along with The Importance of Being Earnest as well because that is my favourite play ever. I can highly recommend both of those if you have not read them and if you're thinking about it. Then there's also a fun overall challenge which is to read by candlelight. I'm not sure if I'll be able to do that. I, I do actually have a, a few candles in the house. Um, I'm not much of a like scented candle person. I, I've i got like an essential oil diffuser that you can put a little tea light under and I sometimes enjoy that in the winter, although not too much because it's not great for pets. So if you, if you have pets, you know, be careful with the essential oils and the aromatics in general. So I'm not much of a scented candle type person, but I do have a set of cheap white tall candles that I use uh, during power cuts because I didn't know this when I moved here, but 21st century Wales is kind of in the past in that there are regular power cuts here, at least one or two a year usually. That's not something I've experienced in Germany, but here, you know, they do happen. So I've got some candles uh, for for that case. Um, maybe a torch would have been more useful, but you know, candles add a bit of atmosphere. So I might get those out of the cupboard and do a little bit of reading by candlelight. We'll see about that. Anyway, I've rambled on for long enough. Um, check out my music playlist uh, if you're interested in Victorian music and tell me if you've read any of the books that I'm planning to read. Tell me if you've ever heard of Lady Florence Dixie. I'm really, really interested to talk about her. She seems like such a interesting person, an interesting author. I'm obviously going to make some Victorian literature related videos during October. Did you expect anything else really? I'm not going to talk about specific ones because I don't want to disappoint you if I promise a video and then don't get to it or it doesn't work out for whatever reason. But I've got some ideas. I've got some ideas. So watch this space for some more Victorian themed stuff in the future. I hope you all have a wonderful Victober. Enjoy your 19th century classics, enjoy your Victorian literature and thank you for watching. Bye.